DW Africa Link. It's Thursday, the 4th of February. We're glad to know that you're tuned in to DW's Africa Link. On this show, we bring you the latest news from across Africa and beyond, coming to you live from our studios here in Bonn, Germany. I'm Isaac Mugabe. And my name is Mimi Mefo. A warm welcome to those of you there following us on our DW Africa Facebook page and also our partner stations across the continent. Please tell us what you think about the topics that we have lined up for you today. Coming up on the program, the International Criminal Court in The Hague convicts former Ugandan rebel leader or commander Dominic Ongwen of war crimes. Dominic Ongwen has been found guilty beyond reasonable doubt of a number of crimes committed in the context of the four specified attacks. Attacks against the civilian population, murder. An ICC's verdict on Dominic Ongwen has left Ugandans with mixed reactions. It's fair to the people of northern region. I think justice at the end of the day has been served, however. Well, we shall be reading some of your comments that you've been sending in on this particular story on live on our Facebook page, W Africa. So stay tuned for the details of this and more. But first, the world news in brief. We shall be right back. DW News. Welcome to the news. My name is Jin Nyinge. The International Criminal Court in The Hague has convicted a former Ugandan rebel commander of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Dominic Ongwen was found guilty of 61 charges, including murder, torture, rape and sexual slavery. The former commander of the Lord's Resistance Army could face a sentence of life in prison. The United Nations humanitarian chief has privately told the UN Security Council that Ethiopia may not have control of up to 40% of embattled Tigray region. Details of the briefing by Mark Lokok were shared by diplomats who spoke on condition of anonymity because the meeting was held in closed door. The Tigray conflict, which has entered its fourth month, remains largely in the shadows as Ethiopia faces growing pressure to open the region to journalists, independent investigators and far more humanitarian aid. Myanmar's military has cut the country off from Facebook days after removing the civilian government. The social media app is a popular news source in Myanmar and has been used extensively to coordinate the growing campaign of civil disobedience. Among those opposing Monday's coup, which saw the arrest of elected leader Aung San Suu Kyi, are medical staff who say they are refusing to work for the military government. The power grab has sparked international condemnation. Today, Myanmar lawmakers held a symbolic parliamentary session in a show of defiance against the coup. We, the citizens of Myanmar, performed fearlessly for these five years we were in office. And now the military coup took place. We can't let it happen in any way. This is kind of terrorism in the country. This news is coming to you from DW in Bonn, Germany. Britain's media watchdog Ofcom has revoked the broadcasting license of China's state-owned channel CGTN. Ofcom says it's against UK broadcasting law for the Chinese Communist Party to control the channel. CGTN opened studios in London in 2019 and was carried on satellite networks in the UK. Syrian state media has accused Israel of launching missile strikes from the disputed Golan Heights. The Britain-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights says Israel targeted a military post for regime forces and pro-Iranian militias. Syria's anti-air defenses retaliated. Israel has not confirmed or denied the operation. And finally, Nepal is facing a nationwide strike in protest at the dissolution of parliament. At least 77 protesters, including a former minister, were arrested in the capital, Kathmandu. Parliament was dissolved on December 20th at the Prime Minister's direction and new elections were announced for April and May. For more news and information, head on to our website dw.com forward slash Africa. My name is Jin Nyinge. 
And you're listening to DW's African program straight from our studios here in Bonn, Germany. Once again, my name is Isaac Mugabe. And I am Mimi Mefu. To all of you that are listening to us on our DW Africa Facebook page, we welcome you like a saying, Daniel, you say, Arrest Museveni is the leader of L-O-R-A, and uh, Mikaya, we can see you there listening from South Africa. Someone from South Africa, welcome on board, Mikaya. And mm. Emmanuel Koikoi, you say you are listening from Liberia. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Monjo Iranios, Okelo William, and uh, Kenji Charles, thank you for joining us. Well said, Bimi. We kick off the program now. The a former commander of the Uganda's notorious Lord's Resistance Army, Dominic Ongwen, has been found guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity by the International Criminal Court based in The Hague, the Netherlands. Thursday's ruling found Dominic Ongwen guilty of 61 crimes, including murder, mutilation, sexual violence, and the use of child soldiers. Now, the verdict outlines the horrors of the LRA's attack on camps for displaced v- civilians in northern Uganda in the early 2000s. Defense lawyers have argued that the child soldier turned commander was a victim and not a perpetrator. Let's have the details of that report with DW's Crispin Mwakideu. Dominic Ongwen, a former Ugandan child soldier who became a commander of the rebel Lord's Resistance Army, was convicted this Thursday of dozens of crimes, including widespread rape, sexual enslavement, child abductions, torture and murder, including killing of babies. Ongwen was found guilty by the International Criminal Court of 61 out of 70 alleged counts of war crimes and crimes against humanity. One of his victims, Lois Lacour, gave testimony of how Ong Wen and his group abducted him at the age of seven, together with his sister, who was three years old, and walked him to their base carrying heavy loads of looted goods. He tied us with ropes and he gave us heavy goods to carry. And he said he doesn't want weak people. So if you ask that you want to rest, he say he can let you rest. And the rest thing he's saying by killing you. I remember when we were walking and my sister was only three years old and he was he cannot walk long distance with heavy goods. Then he came and said they have to kill the sister of mine. They tortured me and they said they were going to kill me if I did not do it. So I have no option but to do it. Sunday Kilama, a former abductee of the Lord's Resistance Army, also spoke of his experience at the hands of Owen and his rebels. We were around 11, I and one of my brother. The other one ran away. One of the rebels entered inside and he ordered us to, to come out. We came out and I was the only one who was taken from that hut. The others, they were killed and the other brother of mine was sent away to go. I'm still traumatized up to now. And it's very hard for me to forget what has happened. We lost some, some of our dears and it's very hard to forget about them. Judges at the court said Ong Wen, who himself was taken by the LRA as a young boy, had acted out of free will in committing innumerable crimes between 2002 and 2005, commanding several hundred soldiers. Passing the guilty verdict, residing Judge Bertram Schmidt said, Dominic Ong Wen has been found guilty beyond reasonable doubt of a number of crimes committed in the context of the four specified attacks on the IDP camps, attacks against the civilian population, murder, attempted murder, torture, enslavement, outrages upon personal dignity, pillaging, destruction of property, and persecution. Prosecutors say he was a ferocious and enthusiastic senior LRA commander in charge of Connie's infamous senior brigade, which also allegedly abducted young girls and women to serve as domestic workers and sex slaves. Despite his crimes and the guilty verdict, his victims like Louis Lacour don't think prison is where Dominic Nguyen should be. I find that Dominic Nguyen should be forgiven because Dominic Nguyen was also been adopted when he was a young boy. He didn't join the rebel by himself. He was being adopted and he was being tortured. The family members were being killed, like the parents. So he has all the trauma on, on his mind. That's why he was be doing it. A hearing in mid-April will consider a possible sentence which could be up to life imprisonment with a decision expected later this year.
And on this big story, Ugandans have welcomed the verdict, describing it as a lesson. Those are uh, Ugandans. They say that it's a lesson to many Ugandans and beyond that when you get involved in acts of terrorism, you will be arrested and prosecuted. Well, our own correspondent in the capital Kampala, that is Alice Gita, went out to find out what exactly the conviction of Dominic Ongwen means to many Ugandans. It's fair to the people of northern region. 20 years of losing their lips, 20 years of losing their limbs, and 20 years of no economic activity. It's really fair, and time is now for anyone that hopes to start war in Uganda to think twice. I think justice at the end of the day has been served. However, that doesn't raise the scars that have been brought about by the LRA insurgents. So, government or the development partners have a hard task of rebuilding the communities, healing the scars, healing the wounds of people in northern Uganda. I'm happy that justice has prevailed after all these years. ICC has convicted him. What next for those who faced all those challenges that were brought up by Dominic Yangwen as an individual? I think whatsoever that has prevailed from the ICC, we should also look into how the victims are gaining from the decision taken by the ICC. The verdict of the court doesn't change anything. And I don't think it makes anyone who is involved in such crimes to fear the, the court. Ideally, when you look at TV following the court proceedings, uh, the man looks good. He's not scared of anything. And I don't think the verdict will change anything about his life and even about the life of the victims who suffered because of his crimes. Hmm. Those were Ugandans reacting to the conviction of Dominic Ongwen. And as you heard in our report, one of the victims himself, uh, Mimi, said that Dominic Ongwen should not be jailed because himself was a, uh, was abducted at nine years old mm-hmm. and then made to carry loads, as we had in that report. Then he was kind of, you know, brainwashed to become into a killing machine. The well, when you look then, at the charges against him, yeah. Isaac, 61 charges against him, yeah. some of them including how he was uh, luring young children into becoming child soldiers, murder and incitement of violence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just a lot of the charges there against him. But we also have reactions on our Facebook page, DW Africa, like Yaba Musa, David who says that the meaning of resistance in Alu, Alu, ROA is not clearly understood. It's a satanic movement not on the Ten Commandments as stated. And uh, OSJ Nixon said uh, they need more people to be tried, not only Dominic. And Kalibara Fritz, you are saying we want to appeal the innocent people not to be used by the state. Many thanks for those comments. Now, yeah, Mimi, staying in Uganda, there's a story that we've been monitoring uh, for many days. It's about the main opposition leader, uh, popularly known as Bobby Wine, a musician turned pop star. But his real name is Robert Chagulanyi. He's scheduled or he's expected to be meeting the press this evening, later this evening, that is the afternoon mm. in the US, to present evidence that the January election results were rigged. Wine and his legal team in the US will also provide evidence of government abuses and rights violations. And Isaac, it should be noted that this is a virtual meeting. Mm-hmm. Bobby Wine, who came second in the January 14th presidential election in Uganda, has maintained that 76 year old President Yuweri Museveni the votes. He filed mm. a petition that was in the court in Uganda days ago to overturn the result. Well, it's going to be a virtual meeting and maybe that evidence, perhaps many people think that he should be taking it to the court, Supreme Court, like he did. But anyway, as usual, we'd always want to read your comments. Drake Mutiwa, you're saying we want him to sign as the president-elect. We voted for him, nothing else, no dialogue, no nothing with dictator M70. We have Vincent who says that EU should uh, shun Museveni. We are tired of a leader imposing himself on the natives now killing the civilians or citizens secretly. And uh, a live comment coming in here from someone called the New Ugandan Zaga. You're saying Museveni must go. Emmanuel Koyoko, you're saying I can say for free that DW remains the best African online newscasting <laughs> agency. Many Thank thanks. you so much. Many thanks, Koyoko. We go ahead with your comments. In Tume Derek, you're saying... Is it democracy when someone challenges the incumbent and is treated like a rebel? 
And we have this one from Charles Colin. I was shocked that uh, for 36 years, Museveni's reign, uh, mm. of Museveni's reign, Uganda's GDP per capita income is still less than uh, $1,000. A big shout out to all our followers and listeners in Uganda, like Acheng Daniel. You're saying Bobby Wine is the elected president of Uganda. We have also Atako John. You're saying hello, always happy to listen to DW Africa. Keep it there at DW Africa. Africa. That's our Facebook page, your platform. And this is Africa Link. We are coming to you live from our studio in Bonn, Germany. My name is Mimi Mefo. And alongside Mimi is me, Isaac Mugabe. You're also listening to this show through our partner stations across the continent. And you, what you can do is log into your Facebook page, go to a page W Africa and share your comments with us. Those already online, let me welcome you once again. Mm-hmm. And Nakai Aneti, you are in Uganda by the name itself. You're saying hashtag genocide in Uganda. Trop Kaila Senior, you're saying we want our President Chagulani and Chosen Blood. Yeah, that's a name that, you know, he prefers to call himself with a picture of Bobby Wine there. You say Museveni must go well. That story about Museveni, he's expected to be, to present, like Mimi, you say it. Yes. With his legal team, the U.S. provide evidence of vote rigging and human rights violations. Yes, Isaac. And coming up in the next 15 minutes, attacks against teachers in schools has prompted authorities in Kenya to introduce corporal punishment. Is this a welcome move? Children should not be beaten in school. Some of these teachers misuse that power that the government has given them. I strongly believe that well-applied corporal punishment will instill discipline in our children. Isaac, mm-hmm. mixed in, reactions there. Yes, yes. In, I mean, there's a saying in English, is spare the road and, and spoil, spoil the, the child. child. But, <laughs> <laughs> but all you can do, Mimi, is to The let, question is, is uh, how, do you, how do you apply that sanction or that punishment on the child? Uh-huh. Is it by beating the child or punishing the child? Uh, that's, that's the, the question. question now. Just tell us what you think. Tell us the question Mimi has clearly put it out there by writing your comment on our Facebook page, DW Africa. Before all that, Gambia's Supreme Court has ruled that Gambians in the diaspora are entitled to register and vote in the elections to the offices of president, members of the National Assembly and local government offices, traditional rulers and referenda. And if everything goes as planned, this will be the first time for Gambians in the diaspora to choose their representatives. But with just 11 months to the presidential elections in the country, can they participate in the upcoming election? Omar Wali tells us more from The Gambia. The Supreme Court ruling came after five Gambians, most of whom lives in diaspora, sued the Attorney General and the Independent Electoral Commission for defranchising the diaspora. Former Vice President and now the leader of the Gambia for All Party, Bakare Bunjadabo, was among five people who took the matter to court. The possibility for Gambians in the diaspora to found political parties or to be part of the leadership or executive bodies of political parties, I think that's a major breakthrough. It is a win for democracy, it is a win for justice, it's, a, it's also an upholding of what the Constitution guarantees. It goes to re- reinforce my confidence in the system of justice of our country, that the courts increasingly are standing up for what is what the law says, rather than just knuckling down to what the executive wants. Gambians in diaspora welcome this historic ruling, since they have contributed to Gambian politics. Gambians in the diaspora should have this opportunity since long ago, but um, having it now as well, it's, it's um, a good opportunity. My reaction personally residing in the diaspora I will obviously uh, be happy if I would be able to vote. But then I think we should also look at the consequences. Gambia is a very, very poor country. Economically, we are actually not strong. So we, I think we have a lot of elapses that we should actually look at, like the health sector. Women are dying while delivering a high rate of um, unemployment youths. So for me, I would rather use that money to develop first our health sector, and perhaps we could look forward to the next election or so. 
considering the huge um, contributions we have been doing in the country. So it is important for us to participate in electoral processes, selecting who to represent us. So this is one of the reasons why um, political parties in the Gambia created like chapters in the diaspora so that we can also share our political ideas and contributions. We welcome the Supreme Court ruling and I think this should also extend to the political offices that we can hold in the country. That is also uh, an area that Gambian diaspora are discriminated against and I think so the fight continues to get that as well. The Independent Electoral Commission has a huge responsibility to ensure that every Gambian eligible to vote is not disfranchised. Samu Janjan, Chief Executive Officer of the Electoral Body, said they accepted the Supreme Court ruling and they have made consultation and the process is on the Independent Electoral Commission voting calendar. It is unclear whether Gambians who are scattered worldwide will be registered in time to vote in the upcoming elections. That is Omar Wali, the reporting. Youth Zone. Now, the International Labour Organization says that one million children between the ages of 5 to 17 work in gold mines around the world. In East Cameroon, many children are leaving schools to work in mines. Uh, this is creating an education gap. Now, local NGOs are trying to step in as DW's Blaze A Young reports for Bidimba, that is in Eastern Cameroon. Musa is digging in search of gold in Eastern Cameroon. Together with his younger brother, he works here seven days a week. The boys have never been to school and don't know how old they are. I come for money. I work at the mine and maybe I can enroll at school. I also want to buy clothes and shoes. My mother works at the mine with us. In Cameroon, schooling isn't mandatory. So parents don't have a legal obligation to educate their children. To make matters worse, remote communities often don't even have a state-run school. The combination of extreme poverty and lack of educational facilities mean many children simply end up mining gold. This school was set up by a local NGO. Their single classroom serves a community of some 500 children, although just over 100 of them actually attend. It's hard to stop those who do from skipping class. According to their teacher, the children are so poor, they are desperate to go back to the mines. The children who do come to school often want to run away, but my efforts prevent them from doing so. If I weren't strict with them, they would have disappeared from the classroom. Philip Dano is a member of a local NGO that helps get children into school. He visits families carrying a message, telling parents, send your children to school. And children, education is vital. The children who work in the mines are in great danger because they are at risk of falling down the mine works. And the children can die if they fall into a shaft. A death like that would be a huge loss, so the community needs to be aware that the school is the best place for these children. Child labor is illegal in Cameroon. There are no statistics on how many work on the country's artisanal gold mines. But for decades, authorities have repeatedly promised to get children off the mines. This job is very difficult. At the end of the day, I'm very tired. But because it's my mother who asks me to come and work here, I have to do it. I can't disobey my mother. Musaik mother declined to speak to us. The boy and his brother still hope to go to school. For now, they are stuck in this mine site with little chance for an education. That was DW's Blaze A. Young reporting from Bidimba in Eastern Cameroon. Mimi, uh, looking at these pictures of these kids in the mines, really, they're pitiful, yeah, to say the Quite. least quite pitiful uh, some of the uh, untold stories of uh, Cameroon mm. and to see this coming from Blaise Ayong who had to travel all the way to the eastern region of Cameroon which is also mm. the border between Cameroon and the Central African Republic where we see a conflict uh, in the Central African Republic is, is actually um, a very very nice report and I think that it should be an eye opener Isaac mm. to the government of Cameroon to know that there are young kids in this part of Cameroon who need to go to school they're not supposed to be working in the Minds. Yes, because education is key to success.
speaking out. Isaac, we mm. announced this earlier. Mm-hmm. We already started having reactions on Facebook. Mm. Uh, officials in Kenya are now looking for ways to start protecting teachers. Mm-hmm. This is because Kenya's education ministry says that it's recorded violent attacks on teachers and arson cases in primary and secondary schools. Well, the background of it is that since schools reopened after the COVID-19 shutdown, the students have become unruly and teachers have called for a return to corporal punishment. They hope that with such punishment, they can bring back the students in line. Now, before we read your comments that are coming in by a minute, let's first listen to this report from our correspondent, Andrew Wasike in Nairobi. Violent attacks against teachers in schools have ignited a debate whether authorities should reintroduce corporal punishment. In the past weeks, students attacked their teachers with knives and other crude weapons and destroyed school property. Florence, a high school student, spoke to me about corporal punishment. Children should not be beaten in schools. Some of these teachers misuse that power that the government has given them. Children have been killed just from being beaten by teachers. Other teachers have personal issues with a student and they will focus on them and make their life miserable, thus killing the morale. In high school, already we have, we are grown-ups, respect us. It is our life. You will not beat me worse than you will beat a thief. This is why you hear some of us are burning schools and beating up teachers. Let us be. If a teacher will beat me now, I will definitely draw a blow or two or one. I am too delicate and too precious to be beaten by someone who is not my parent. Even my parent doesn't beat me. All people should not focus on old ways. Florence believes that physical punishment is inhumane, harmful and ineffective. She also thinks that it can contribute to more aggression. However, for the older generation like 45-year-old teacher Victor Kimani disagrees but says under the new constitution they can only counsel children. When a child makes noise in class, what we normally do is to cancel them. We have to talk to them. Okay, now, what happens if I were to be asked, I would say that uh, it is not bad to cane pupils. But you see now, the, con- the current constitution in our country states that you are not supposed to do any kind of caning. So now that is where now the, the challenge is. In 2001, the Kenyan government banned corporal punishment in schools and enacted the Children's Act which entitles children to protection from all forms of abuse and violence. Despite that law already in place, its custodian education minister, George Magoha, believes using corporal punishment is the most effective way to discipline children and should be reintroduced. I strongly believe that well-applied corporal punishment will instill discipline in our children. But you see, there's a law. There's a law which bars that one. So until the law... It's changed. In fact, I keep asking myself, did we change the law in order to follow the external culture or not? Because in our culture, it is okay to smack a child responsibly. But as a minister, I cannot make that pronouncement without due process. It remains to be seen when or whether corporal punishment will be reintroduced in Kenya. Andrew Watsike with that report, and uh, we promised, we promised Mimi to read the comments that uh, people are sending on our Facebook page, please. I see this one from Chosen Blood. No, a little kin when a pupil does something wrong, it electrifies the, bl- the brain and it's a therapy itself. And Babidia Amina, you're saying, I've not yet given birth, but if any teacher beats my kid, you exclaim, huh? I don't know what I can do for them. <laughs> and we also see Mohamed Bao says that it's about time and thanking DW for the news. Now we revisit our major story for today, the conviction of Dominic Nguyen, who was the commander of the Uganda's notorious Lord's uh, Resistance Army. Isaac, we also got a lot of reactions. Yes, he was found guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity. And by the way, just to bring our people to speed, he's the fourth to be convicted by the ICC. There was Congolese warlord Thomas Lubanga, and uh, there was Malian jihadist Ahmed Al-Faki Al-Mahdi, and also Congolese rebel warlord Bosco Ntaganda, also nicknamed the Terminator. So far, the ICC has convicted uh, four former warlords. And to your comments.
Iran Bobby says that he was abducted and indoctrinated to kill, just like you said, Isaac. But there is a yeah. criminal in authority he abducted and trained children who served his interests. Yeah, Mimi, you know, the, as a matter of fact, rights groups have been, you know, haggling with the question of burden of responsibility. Some are saying he's a victim who turned into a perpetrator, but the defense, his defense said, you can't be both. You can't be victim and perpetrator. He was a victim, and we had in that report ourselves one of the victims saying, no, they should release him, though he did bad things to me. We also have this reaction from mm. Okelo William, arrest dictator Museveni. Everybody seems to be talking about the fallout of yeah. the January 14th presidential election in Uganda. William continues to say that he is the mastermind of the violence against tribes that resisted him in northern Uganda and recently the Kasase massacres. One final one, Kabugo Sheriff Musa, you're saying you're listening from Uganda. You want to thank us for broadcasting what's happening there. Many thanks. And on that note, we come to the end of the show. My name is Isaac Mugabe. And I am Mimi Mefo. Goodbye for now. DW Made for Minds.